already read it before so just kind of relax and we're going to move into the word on today amen. amen once again we thank God for you and like I said on yes on last week since most of y'all have not ventured to come to Bible study amen. we're gonna have we're gonna continue Bible study today right, right amen as we talk about the Word of God and yeah. believe it or not you know it's funny because you know you, you come up with all these all these, no titles, Dick. You know, all these great titles and it sound real good. And I forgot my title last week. So I, I remember the title this week. <laughs> and the, and uh, we, we, we're going to be continuing to discuss and have this conversation on being sanctified yet satisfied with Scripture. Sanctified yet satisfied with Scripture. The reason why we say sanctified yet satisfied because I don't know about y'all, but I don't know when I was growing up, you used to you used to always hear the you always, people always say how about you know I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, right? And usually when they say that though, they they have a they have a like a, a grim look on their face, like they ain't really happy about being sanctified, you know, and that maybe their sanctification ain't satisfying them, you know. And so I want you to know that really truly, thank you. Really, truly, you can be sanctified and satisfied with the scriptures. Amen. I, I, ain't hear, I, ain't hear no, I heard one or two amen, Brother Chris and Brother and Deacon Hawk. I'm going to say it one more time. You can be sanctified and satisfied with the scriptures. If, if, if you want to be. If you want to be. Because see, the scriptures, many times, what happens is, the scripture go against what we want to do. All right. Now, okay, I'm sorry. Maybe y'all don't. Maybe y'all good. I, I know there have been times, more than once, that I wanted to do something that the scripture said you ought not do. I wasn't happy with the scripture then because I wanted to do my thing. But I realized that doing my thing puts me in a worse predicament if I were to do the right thing, amen? amen? But here's what I like though, even when I do the wrong thing, yeah. if, I, if I run back to the Lord and I repent after I've done the wrong thing, yeah. then he has enough forgiveness for me and enough mercy for me to be able to allow me to right that wrong thing. Yeah. And that's why as the older I get, the more I can truly, I can truly say I'm becoming more and more satisfied with being sanctified with the scriptures. Now last week we were talking about, you know, I was trying to share with you also in this Bible study that what happens is what in, in, in this passage with Timothy, what Paul is doing is Paul is really trying to tell Timothy, Timothy, I'm showing you all the stuff that is going on around you. I'm showing you all the stuff that is happening. And I want you to know, Timothy, at the, and, and he goes into, into the fourth chapter, when he gets down with telling him and everything, the second and the third chapter, he says, but Timothy, I want you to simply preach the word. Because it's something in the word that if they get the word and they get it down in their spirit, Timothy, they'll be able to correct all the stuff that I, we were talking about in the second and the third chapter. And I'm coming to believe that Paul is right when, when, he, when he tells Timothy, after all that stuff, a whole lot of stuff going to be happening to Timothy, but all you need to do, Timothy, is preach the word. Because the word will, will heal 
whatever it is you're dealing with. Yeah. The word will handle whatever it is you are dealing with. The word will help you yeah. in whatever it is you are dealing with. Yeah. And so he says, preach the word. Amen. Preach the word. Now, as we were closing out last week, I was sharing with you, you know, as we were talking about all the stuff that was happening, I, I wanted to share with you also in the book of 2 Timothy, the reason why this is so important, in the book of 2 Timothy, at least 10 times, at least 10 times, in the book of 2 Timothy, um, from the first to the fourth chapter, at least 10 times, uh, Paul references the word, and it's either the word, the gospel, testimony of, of the Lord. But in, in the book of Timothy, he, he literally referenced the word of God at least 10 times. And so and, and in doing so, uh, that caught my attention because what he was doing, he was sharing with us that Timothy, that at the end of it all, understand that it really is the word of God that's going to really help you in your situation. And so I wanted to continue some more Bible study today, and then we'll get more into the, the deeper parts of the word next week. But I wanted to continue some more Bible study today because I want you to understand here how the word actually works if you use it. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So I was looking at Timothy, and I was looking in the, in the first chapter where he literally says, uh, Timothy, I, I want to, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmama and in your mama, that they, these are Pastor Hargrove's words, and your grandmama, and then your mama, uh, Lois, and then your mother, Eunice, he says, I'm persuaded it is in you also. And so what I, what I was thinking about is that what happens is when we begin to really understand the word from, from, from our younger days, uh -huh. but listen to who he said gave it to him. He says his grandmama uh -huh. and his mama yeah. poured the word into him. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So in other words, Part of, our, part of our issue have to be that the question is, are you pouring the word into your children? Mamas, grandmamas, daddies, granddaddies, aunts, uncles, are you pouring the word? Because if you're not pouring the word into your children, then what, what Paul comes and then tells Timothy the rest of the chapter or the rest of the book won't be of no use to Timothy because Timothy will not know what what to use to go by because if Paul is referencing the word and Timothy doesn't have the word, then he can't use the word. So I realize what happens in our life now is that many times we are, you know, I can get up and I can preach all day long, but if you have not, if you, if you have not the word, then I can preach the word all day long, but if you don't have the word, you may not be able to connect with the word because the word is not in you. Our, how I want to put this, our people are dying because of the lack of the word of God in our lives. Okay, 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 okay. Let me, let, let me get on back over here real quickly so I can share something with you. So, so because I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So Paul was telling Timothy in the first chapter, but then look what Paul does later on. He says, in verse, in verse 8, he says, therefore... Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. That's the word. In other words, don't be ashamed of the word of God, Timothy. And then don't be ashamed of me, the prisoner of God, as I'm teaching you, based on the gospel. Right? But then he says that not only was his mother and his grandmother, you know, um, instrumental in the word of God being in his life, but then Paul says, I also was instrumental in the word of God in your life, Timothy, because he says, here he says, um, Let me get this word. Therefore, if anyone, I lost, my page. I lost my page here. Oh, here we go. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to, listen to this, to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So he says, Timothy, you get it because your mom and your, and your grandmama gave it to you. But now remember, Timothy, I also I also did. I also literally committed some time to you. I also literally tried to pour into you, Timothy, as my son in the gospel. But now, Timothy, I want you to pour into others because as your mama and grandmama poured into you and I poured into you, now it is time for you to pour into others 
Because what happens is, this is why he's talking about preach the word, because at, at the end of the day, it's the word that's going to sell, that's going to solve your issues that you're going, that you're going through. It's not going to, it's not going to stop you from going through some things, but it'll help you get through what you are going through. As a matter of fact, it'll help you avoid some stuff that you don't have to go through. And as a matter of fact, when you go through some stuff that you can put yourself in, it'll help you get out of the stuff that you went through because you put yourself in the stuff that you went through. So he says, Timothy, I need you to commit these things also to faithful men because the faithful men were then committed to their families. Oh. Let me... I didn't, I didn't hear too many. I heard Deke out there. Because you do know that as men, it is your job if you have children. It is your job, not your wife's job, not the mama's job. It is your job to be able to commit the word of God to your children, to your family. Brother Steve, they got kind of quiet on me. All right, well, let, let's go because I'm sure because, see, the world don't tell you that. The world just says, hey, you know, do what you want to do. Feel how you want to feel. Say what you want to say. You know, y'all good to go. But the reason why, because not can share this in the scripture, he says, he says, fathers, provoke not your children unto wrath, but rear them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So he says, if you don't rear them right, then you provoke them to wrath because they don't know how to fight because they don't know how to fight right because you have not reared them right. So they fight the wrong fight and they fight with the wrong equipment and therefore they lose the battles every time they fight because they don't have the right stuff to fight with. Which is the word. Now, okay. All right. So as I'm going through, he's talking about the word of truth. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the truth. He's talking about the holy scriptures. Now, remember I shared with you guys last week about Jeho Jehoshaphat, the king? You know, we you know a lot of times we, 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 what we do is we literally, um, there's a passage in 2 Chronicles, don't go there right now, but in 2 Chronicles, there's a passage out into like the 20th chapter of 2 Chronicles, I believe it is, where it says that, you know, that, that, um, um, that Jehoshaphat came up against Moab and came up against, and came up against the Moabites and Ammonites, and all these big old armies started coming after him. Yeah. And so it said that and said that Jehoshaphat, he said that he literally he, he literally saw all those souls coming at him. And, but then he said he, he feared the Lord. And, he, and then he prayed. Yeah. And, but then say and no, after he prayed, then he got the people to pray. Yeah. And then after he prayed and the people prayed, then the word of the Lord came to him from the prophet. And after the word of the Lord came to him from the prophet and the Lord and the Lord told him what to do. He said, the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord's. And then he says, now what I want you to do is go pray some more. And then go do some more worship. And go do some more praising. And then when they started to pray, praise, and worship, it said that then God set the ambushes. And that God whooped the enemies while they were still praising, praying, and worshiping. To the point where it says, not only did he whoop them bad, though, he said he whooped them and they went down and then they got all the enemies stuff. And recovered all the enemy's goods. And recovered everything that belonged to the enemy and not belonged to them. And so because he prayed, praised, and worshipped, yeah. then God went on his behalf yeah. to fight the battle. Yeah. Now, now, now we shout on that all the time, D. And you, and you should shout on that. Yeah. But I need to show you how that got set up. Because they just didn't pray. They just, they just didn't pray. They had to be taught. Right. Oh, okay. So you have to go back to the 17th chapter. Uh, Second Chronicles, and let me let me show you what it says in Second, you know, in uh, in, in in the seventeenth chapter of Second Chronicles. I got to read it because I know I'm getting old. I'm getting forgetful. I don't remember scripture like I used to. So it says, "Then Jehoshaphat the son, his son, reigned in his place and strengthened himself against Israel." It says, "And he placed troops in all the fortified cities." In other words, he built up militarily. He set garrisons in the land of Judah and and in the, in the and the Ephraim city, in the cities of Ephraim, so he'll set, he'll, you know, get things, you know, solidified in, in a place. But then it says, in verse, in verse uh, three, says, "Now the Lord 
was with Jehoshaphat. Because he walked in the ways of his father, David. And he did not seek false worship. Or he did not seek the Baals. But now you have to, but, his, but he sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments. And not according to the acts of Israel. But here's where it gets good. He says, and his heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. So basically, on chapter 20 would not have happened had chapter, C, had, to cha had chapter 17 not happened. In other words, it says Jehoshaphat began to delight all, his whole heart in all the ways of God. Yeah. But it doesn't stop there. Because then it says what Jehoshaphat did in his third year, he said he sent some leaders to teach in the cities of Judah. Right. Now see, you've been, you should have been shouting right there. Yeah. He said he sent some folk to teach. Yeah. What did they teach in the cities of Judah? They taught the word of God. He sent the leaders. He sent the priests. He sent the, uh, the, the Levites. All of them, he said, he sent all of them. He said, and so they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them at all times. All right. So literally, he had Judah being taught the word of God in the 17th chapter. So that, that way, when it got to the 20th chapter and he began to pray and he told them to pray, they knew what they were praying about. They knew the God they were praying to and they knew what the God they were praying to could do based off of being taught the word. Amen. 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 See, some things don't have to be too diff so difficult. It don't have to be so difficult. Our lives don't have to be so difficult. If we learn how to obey, if, if we learn how to not just obey the word, but be, you know, but, but, be, but allow the word to live in our lives. Remember last week, some of, some of the words I told you that how the word of God was intimate, you know, and how the word, how the word of God has to get in you. Because as the word of God gets in you, then the word of God begins to control you more. As the more the more the word that gets in you, the more it, it controls you. The less that get in you, the less it controls you. In the book of Amos, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not of bread and not of water, but of the word of God. Wait a minute, God, you mean tell me you're going to send a famine of the word that you want us to learn? He says, yeah, I'm going to send a famine of the word of God because you don't appreciate my word. So let me show you how, let, let me show you how it's going to be without you knowing my word okay. and understanding my word. Yeah. Deacon Hawk, there's a famine of the word of God in our lives right now. All, right. All, right. All hell is breaking loose yeah. because there's a famine of the word of God. There's a famine of the scriptures being let loose in our lives, in our homes. And because there's a famine of the word of God, all hell is breaking loose in your life. It's not because the government ain't good. It's because the word is not situated in your life like it needs to be. All right. I got, I got a bunch of scriptures here. They're just I mean, we, we're still in Bible study. We're, we're still in Bible study. Because I want you to understand what the Bible says about the word. And so in Matthew, the fourth chapter, Jesus simply says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by a word, by some words, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So he says, your sustenance is not just the bread you eat physically. Your sustenance has to be the word you eat spiritually, psychologically, emotionally. Yes, your, your, your sustenance has to be the word that you, that, that you literally chew on every day and becomes a part of you. This is this, this Bible. We just in Bible study right now. We just in Bible study. I forgot to take advantage of Bible study right now. And so, understand, he says, the word says, you can't live. 
by the bread alone. You can't make all the money. You can't, you know, have all the stuff. You can't have everything you want and, and still think you're going to be satisfied because at the end of the day, he says, unless you have the word of God, you still can't live. You still cannot do what you need to do without the word of God being in your life, existent and living. He says, for I said to you, hey, before heaven and earth pass away, this word, he says, it says, if anything happens, you know, understand, if you, do, if you do anything to this word, this is Hargo's translation, if you do anything to this word and try to change this word, trust me, he says, I will, I will cancel heaven and earth right away. In other words, okay, let me, let me put in Jesus' word so y'all didn't get that one. For surely I say to you, till... Heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law until all is fulfilled. So as, as we're talking about the word of God and the importance of the word, and, and, and that's why I'm talking, going, back to, going back to Paul's, you know, um, his, his teaching in Timothy on preach the word, there's a reason why Paul is so adamant about the word being preached. Because if the word is not preached, according to Paul in Romans, he says that how can they hear without a preacher? And how can he preach except unless he be sent? And, then, and, what, and what is he going to preach? He's going to preach the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is right now the most important thing in your life yeah. to be able to get and understand. You must know the word of God. Yeah. I'm not talking about you got to know the, know the Holy Bible from cover to cover. Or, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that you got to memorize it from cover to cover. But you must know the Word of God. It's more intimate. As a matter of fact, there's another scripture I got here for you somewhere. Where, where, where Jesus says, he says, he says, here it is. If you abide in me. He says, if you abide, I'm sorry, if you abide in my word. John 8. You are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. He says, if you abide in me, he says, if you abide in, in my word, if you hang out in my word, he says, you're not just going to have knowledge of it. See, see that, that's the difference. He says, you're not just going to have knowledge of it. If my word becomes intimate to you, he says, you, it will become now, you, as you become intimate with my word, my word becomes intimate with you. You will know the truth. Not hear of the truth. He says you will know the truth. That, that, that's a term of intimacy in the Bible. You will know the truth. You will be intimate with the truth. And because you're intimate with the truth, the truth shall make you free. All right. I guess y'all getting kind of kind of acclimated to being outside, so I'm, I'm just going to attribute to that right there. <laughs> And so then there's another, there's another passage of scripture um, here in, in Peter where Peter says this. He says, because sometimes y'all, remember I told y'all last week, don't let somebody who don't know the word of God tell you that what the word of God is or is not. Remember when I told you, don't let somebody who don't know Jesus tell you what the word of God says. Remember I told you, don't, 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 remember I told you, I said, don't let somebody who don't know Christ tell you who Christ is. Remember I told you, Yes, last week, that don't let somebody who don't know the Bible try to teach you the Bible. You know why? Because they can't teach what they don't know. And what they will tell you is that they will, they will cause things to, to, to then come at you and they'll cause you to walk away from what God is trying to call you to because they, they know not God and you ought to know not them because they know not God. So, look at what Peter said. He says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Woo! He says you will do well to heed this prophetic word that's been confirmed. In other words, that's been confirmed in Christ Jesus. You will do well to heed it. What does it mean, what does it mean to heed? To obey it, to live it, to love it, to learn it. You will do well to do this. He said you will do well to heed this because what it will do is it will be a light that shines in a dark place. In other words, the psalmist says that thy word, Lord, Lord, is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. Wherever I go, the word will give me light where I walk. As a matter of fact, the word will show me where I need to walk. 
Y'all, it's not hard though. Cause I know, I know y'all looking at me like, well, well, come on, I, I, I gotta be, I, I, I gotta be, I gotta be in the word twenty four hours a day. No, no, you don't have to. As a matter of fact, really quickly, I, I just thought about this. As a matter of fact, really quickly, sometimes, um, Deacon Hawk, I'm, I'm in my, I'm in my, my devotional time, and, and, and it gives you, it gives you different scriptures to read. And so sometimes, and I get, I get mad, but because I'm trying to finish the scripture reading, so that I can, I can check it off. Say I read that scripture today, right? But sometimes. The Lord stopped me in the middle of that scripture and began to reveal stuff to me based off of what's in that scripture. And then I end up spending 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes on that one scripture, that one verse. But and, and immediately, immediately then my my anger go away because now the Lord is filling me with some stuff he needs me to know for that day. What am I trying to get you to understand? I'm trying to get you to understand that the word of God is living and that you don't have to know the whole Bible from cover to cover. But when you open the scripture, the scripture will talk to you if you allow it to talk to you because it's the living word of God for you. It is not just simply um, words on a piece of paper. Remember I told you inspiration simply means that it is the voice of God put to print. Every time you open that Bible, you are, you are listening to the voice of God in print. Yeah. Amen. And who knows better than God? Hallelujah. Who knows better than God? But I had to learn a lesson to do because, I, because I, I was like, man, I want to, you know, I want to get through so I can check off my, and say that I read my scripture for the day. I read, I read my Old Testament. My Old Testament and my New Testament, my Gospel and, and my Psalm, and I can check it off. And it look good when people when people go, go come to my um, library and they see all my little devotional books, and they open the do devotional book and they say, "Man, he got he, he done read a whole lot of stuff. He can check it off, check it off, check it off." But God ain't worried about you checking off a scripture. God is worried about you being able to understand that word and it becomes intimate with you, and intimate to you. And he's going to show you based off of what he has told you what he can do and what he will do. It has not been a time yet that, that the Lord has gotten my attention while I'm reading scripture and, and, not, and not showing me something at that point that helped me that day. That day, not, not, the, not the following day, not the following week, but that day. Because I slowed up enough to hear what he was saying as I was reading his word. Y'all, I'm trying to lab belabor this point because I want you to understand that the, Bi the Bible reading is just not something you just want to just do. Yeah. Bible reading is you do because your life depends on it. Your life depends on how you read or if you read scripture because that scripture will, will talk to you. It will change you if you allow it to change you. I spent too much time on that one. There's another passage real quickly in this Bible said I'm almost done. In Hebrews 4, chapter 11 through the 13th verse says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter to that rest. But he says, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts, listen to this, and intents of the heart. See, so, you, so you, what, what's happening is the word is, is just that incisive where, remember I told you that was another word I gave you last week was incisive. The word is so incisive. It is so sharp. It, 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 is, so, it, it is so keen that it will cut out what needs to be cut out without cutting out what don't need to be cut out. If you let it, though, if you let it. So last week, and, and, and I, I, I ended with talking about how the word is informative, how the word is, you know, uh, instructional, how the word is incisive, how the word is institutional, and how the word is intimate. Y'all remember me ending with that, with that passage last week or that, those, those eyes last week? Let me give you a few more eyes real quick before we're done. Okay, y'all ready? You ready? Okay, so not only, the word, not only is the word, you know, um, incisive, in, informative, instructional, um, intimate, and in, institutional, the word of God also is intentional. 
Write it down. Don't look at me. I need you to write this down because it's intentional because when you begin to read it, the Spirit of God is going to lead you where he needs you to go in the Word to be able to help you where you are in your life. Okay. Maybe you want to go to Dr. Phil or, or, or Oprah or, or some of these, some of these, um, these uh, what they call them, the, these shows now, the, um, what they call them when they, 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 they call them the real something, like real living or whatever the case. You know, they, they, they have all these crazy shows now where they have everybody you know, showing their life on, on TV. What's it called? Reality. Thank you, reality, yeah, reality TV. Yeah, reality TV. See, that, that, that goes to show you. I don't know all about that stuff. So, but we'd rather go to reality TV, and we'd rather hear from reality TV. We'd rather hear from reality TV and the nonsense that goes on than from the word, from the word of God. I, I, as a matter of fact, let me challenge y'all real quickly, and, I, and, I, and I'll get to my other eyes. Let me challenge y'all real quickly, and that is this. For those of you who watch reality TV, do me a favor. Just take one half hour of the multiple times you watch reality TV a day and open up your scripture in place of the reality TV and watch what God does for you. Okay, y'all didn't get that one. Then, then let me help you with this one real quickly. And so those of us who like a lot of sports, why would, let, 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 let's, let's take at least a half an hour, maybe an hour, of the time we watch ESPN and then insert the word of God in that time. Once a, once a day. Once a day. I mean, we watch, because we watch it every day, right? We, we, watch it, we watch it every day, right? And so let, let us take just, just a half an hour to an hour of something else. Insert the word of God and watch what God does for you in your life. That's me up here. That's me up here. That's me up here. That's, that's my line. means I'm done. So let me get your last eyes. And then we'll be done with Bible study for right now. And then we'll get down to the last three, to, to the last three Sundays of, you know, being able to be sanctified and satisfied. I'm going to show you how to be sanctified and satisfied Amen. with the scriptures. All right. Amen. So, so, so take, take, take these words down. So the word of God is also intentional. Uh, uh, Elder, here's your word right here. The word of God is also inexorable. Inexorable. I-N-E-X-O-R-A-B-L-E. Inexorable. You know what that word means, inexorable? That word inexorable means that it is, it cannot be moved. <laughs> I love that word. It cannot be moved. You have the word of God in your life. It cannot be moved. Now, you can go around it, but the word of God is not going to change. And then the next word actually is immutable. Because, see, inexorable is not only, can it, can it not only not be changed or moved, and also it means, you can look it up in your, in your dictionary, it also means that it can't be stopped. When something is inexorable, it means that it can't be stopped. So the word of God can't be stopped. The word of God is also immutable. It cannot be what? Immutable means what? Come on, come on, ministers. It can't be changed. Can't be changed. And then last one, the word of God is inerrant. There is no error with the word of God. I don't care how much you want but people tell you, well, that's man's word, that's man's Bible. At the end of the day, I serve a God that can hold together his word. And keep his word inerrant no matter what errant man does with it and to it. So the word of God is inerrant. The word of God is immutable, is inexorable, it's inerrant. Now y'all can add them to the other ones I gave y'all last week. I got some more for you, but we'll wait. On, we'll, we'll wait. <laughs> Here, here's what I want you to understand, and I'm done. But I, I want you to walk away with, if you haven't, if you haven't so, you know, gotten it by now, how passionate I am about you and I learning how to really walk with the word. Y'all, I'm telling you that the stuff that we encounter in our lives, half of it we want to encounter and then the other half, it'll be dealt with in a different way, and we don't have to worry about it. 
God is saying, I've left you something here. You know, and, that, and, and as Peter says, I left you something to walk with. It's a light to your path. Yeah. It, it'll, it'll light your way through dark yeah. times. Yeah. But you've got to believe that. Yeah. It can't be just a Bible with, a co with covers on it. Y'all, it just can't be a Bible. This word has to saturate you. In other words, you just can't open it when you come, on, come here on Sunday morning. You have to open it through the week. But when you open it, then you also have to open your heart to it. And open your heart to him to be able to share with you what he wants you to know. Amen? Amen? So, y'all, we done Bible study. We'll get down to the, to the preached word on next week. Okay, we'll get down to the preached word on next week. We'll get down to the, to the, to the instruction on how the word can be sanctified and satisfying in your life. Because it can. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you on this day for being so wonderful. We thank you for just the word of God. We thank you for those who are here, those who may be listening. It is our prayer that something has been said here, Father, with the word and understanding the emphasis that Paul places on preaching the word and how the preached word goes out and then how we receive the preached word and then we live the preached word and then we teach the preached word to those, Father, in our lives. But knowing, Father, that Paul puts the focus on the word of God and he puts emphasis on the word. He prioritizes the word. And God, he, he calls the word to be preeminent in our lives. In other words, he calls it to be first. It is my prayer, God, that we will receive this word, walk in it, and that we will live, Father, in the victory and in the freedom and deliverance that it will declare and give to us. We say thank you. We give you praise and we give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' precious name, we do pray. Amen? Amen. Amen.